The IPO season is real, and we are looking at a ton of companies that are actually going into the space. On kind of the innovation side of things, my name is Paul Barron. This is the Barron Report. Today, we're going to jump into an innovator in the plant-based food business, and that is none other than Impossible Foods. Impossible Foods has been, uh, I think, dancing around the idea of an IPO uh, with Pat Brown for quite some time. This company is uh, and has been asked, I think, by a lot of uh, both suitors and also investors and probably private investors, uh, including myself, that uh, not as a private investor, but as an analyst in looking at the market, why has this company not gone public yet? And I think this is going to be the video that hopefully will reveal how and what and when maybe this company does go uh, public. Impossible Foods is basically a made-from-plants product. This company is a head-to-head -head competitor to Beyond Meat, though when you look at both Ethan Brown and Pat Brown, no relation, um, they don't really talk about each other as competitive uh, players. They look more at the total market for just animal-based proteins, which is kind of the whole goal of where Pat Brown is going with this in the sense of that his market share is much larger than what is going on in terms of the vegan-based business. So if I, th and, I th and I think that if both um, Impossible and Beyond Meat are focusing on just that in terms of trying to convert meat eaters into utilizing their products, then I think there is a good play here. And it's probably going to be one of those companies that really kind of moves to the next level, much like Beyond Meat does has done. If you have not had a chance to check out my video on Beyond Meat, I did a full market analysis on Beyond Meat and why I think that company is actually way undervalued right now and where they're going to be going uh, in terms of growth. But I want to jump back, jump back to Impossible Foods and talk about their potential. So the idea is, is that we're seeing um, a lot of indicators, I won't call them rumors, but indicators that there's several uh, potential SPAC companies, uh, SPACs, special acquisition corporations, companies that are looking to try to make a, a run at Impossible Foods. The difference is, is really the valuation here, which is 10 billion uh, based on what some of the reports are coming in at. If the valuation of this company comes in at 10 billion versus its previous valuation, which happened in uh, just this past year, over the past year, at $4 billion, then uh, we got to talk about that because I want to kind of break down some of the things that we want to look at. One is going to be the consumer sentiment, the operator sentiment for restaurants, also where the plant-based growth is, and also the emerging companies. We're going to cover all those in today's video, but let's talk about the suitors for a second. Now, if you look here, there's two that I've kind of picked out. There's many that are looking at this, but there's two that I think might make it. There's one more that I think is on, on the verge of, of maybe being the call out for that, but I'm going to go with these two. One is Natural Order Acquisition, which launched in 2020. Um, basically, this company is led by Parrish Patel uh, and also Castagoni, which is basically the founder of several food companies. They're well known in the food community and they've raised over 200 million, which puts it as kind of the smaller side, but it could get a piece of impossible foods in terms of a play. Also, Jack Creek Investment. Now, the reason I think this one is potentially there is because of Samir Call. Uh, Call is a member of Kasha, or, uh, Kajla Ventures, which is an investor in possible in Impossible Foods already. That could be a friendly venture that could roll that up into a bigger SPAC and come out with a full-blown uh, product. Now, the question is really, as I said, is where is the valuation going to come out? What do they think this company is going to be worth before we even would look at price targets and kind of where it's going? If you look at the team behind Impossible Foods, and, and this is where I would argue against the company. And um, if you look at the team, listen, Pat Brown, star in, in terms of the science behind what's happening at Impossible Foods, and I love his overall mission. I had a chance to listen to one of his recent interviews and uh, take a listen to this, because I think you're going to find out that it, his vision is much bigger than what I think a lot of people give him credit for. You need to make, to, in, order to, in order to replace animals in the food system, you need to make foods that deliver what consumers want. Not just something that you want them to want, it has to be something that they want. Yeah. And 
and they care about deliciousness above all, nutrition and affordability and convenience and so forth. Well, nutrition is easy. It's easy to make something that outperforms, mm -hmm. you know, meat from animals in terms of the nutritional profile. Cost is is in many ways easy because if you're using less of all the resources that drive the cost of animals, you know, less land, less water, less fertilizer, less pesticides, less labor, um, you have a cost advantage. The hard part is deliciousness. And um, so when I founded the company, with the goal being to develop a technology to completely replace animals in the food system and compete in the market against the foods from animals, um, I started with the premise that the most important scientific question in the world wasn't what I had been working on at Stanford. It was understanding what makes meat delicious. If, if you can answer the question, what makes meat delicious, you can solve, you can eliminate the greatest environmental threat our planet has ever faced, which is the catastrophic impact of animal-based foods on, on the planet. Well, our mission is to completely replace animals in the food system by 2035. So, and you laugh, but we are absolutely serious about it. And I think it's, it's doable. And I'll just say, better technology wins in the market. So as you can see, the idea behind where he's going is huge. I mean, he is really pushing into a, uh, a world where there will no longer be animal proteins. If he can go into really creating a dent in that market, this is a massive, massive business. And it's a great opportunity for a company like Impossible to become a long-term play in your portfolio uh, in going forward. So uh, that I think is the big thing. All right, so I wanna jump back to his team for a minute. And if you look at the alignment of what he's got in terms of his senior executive crew, um, I always look at an IPO company or a company prepping for IPO, much like you look at someone like a Tesla, which is underneath Elon, you've got, you know, uh, Carpathy, you've got Baglino, you've got Zach. Uh, all these, these particular people are rock stars in a company like a Tesla. Now, granted, Tesla has been on IPO for quite some time. They've been able to build their team. So I don't want to hold that against impossible. But if you look back at this chart, of where they currently are. Dennis Woodside, uh, Dana Wagner, Nick Holla, uh, who's Senior Vice President of International, and then Rachel Conrad, uh, the comms uh, director. There's a couple of new entries here. One is John York. I'm gonna talk about him in a second. And then uh, David Borky, who is an interim CFO for Impossible, who replaced a previous CEO, obviously, but is he going to carry this through the finish line or is this going to be one of those things that Pat uh, is going to have to kind of carry this? Now, most IPOs will usually have a very strong CEO, being Pat Brown, and they are usually enough to get the vision out there, present it for the new investors and kind of get the game going. But I feel like Impossible is in a position right now where when they hit the ground, on uh, IPO day, they're gonna be expected to be performing because you're gonna see huge cash injection to this company. I'm assuming that they've got a full lineup of where they're gonna be able to take this product and how, how, how quickly they can take this product. If you look at the team and break this down further, I wanna kind of break down uh, the hire from Vanderbilt University Biochemistry Department Chair, Dr. John York. He is now the Chief Science Officer over at Impossible, and it's a recent hire, okay? This is just recently done in the last six months. The other one that is kind of interesting to me is this one um, <laughs> right here that kind of looks like a, a mugshot there, <laughs> but, uh, but a little bit in the sense of uh, Steve Turner. Now, Steve Turner was the Apple creative leader uh, of, the, of kind of their customer experience side. Now, don't get me wrong, if you're looking at, at getting anyone from Apple, I think that's a good hire. Is he going to become the chief experience officer for a food brand, even though it is a tech food brand, and he's not really led a tech chief experience role in the past? I don't know. That, just, that feels like a little bit of a weak hire to me. This should have been, a company like Impossible could really go shopping here maybe with this new payday for them and get some rock star 
team members because listen, if you listen, if you look at and talk to any great leader that is out there running a, a well-balanced uh, publicly traded company, it is about the team that makes it work that is going to grow this company to the, to the next level because you're going to need to be able to see a lot of these kind of things. When you look at some of the latest financials of where this company is flowing, one thing that is kind of referenced here, you know, just this Yahoo Finance piece, um, was really kind of this, this whole framework that Ethan and Pat, no relation, Pat Brown being over at uh, Beyond Meat, Ethan, or Ethan over at Beyond Meat, Pat over at, at Impossible, they're essentially saying, we're not really competing with each other. So I think when you look at that kind of scenario of these two looking to somewhat align their visions and going after animal protein companies as their number one nemesis for growth, I think this has a lot of potential here in terms of really building up this company's uh, value very quick. The other thing that I wanna look at is some consumer sentiment data that we pulled off of our own labs product. And we compared Impossible, Beyond, and Tyson. Tyson is by far the biggest uh, animal protein company. Basically, this is just a consumer sentiment all running all the way back to Q2 of last year. Uh, blue in Beyond, Impossible in the orange, and then Tyson. Tyson has always had kind of a little bit of a struggle in sentiment, only not necessarily because there is a bad company. They just don't get out there in terms of a well-known company from the consumer side of things. But if you look at where Impossible is on sentiment, they're actually outperforming Beyond Meat. And Beyond Meat is doing great, but remember, because they're a publicly traded company, news and information is a completely different cycle than what Impossible is having to deal with right now because Impossible is doing this all behind closed doors. They can control the narrative. Once they go public, everything starts moving out and it's a different game altogether. So we could see a little bit of a shift downward uh, or possibly even upward, depending on what they have up their sleeve to make this IPO fly. Uh, that could be really taking it into a really interesting position. Now, consumer sentiment is always a, a, a leading indicator for when we look at IPO and or publicly traded stocks, usually consumer sentiment moves are an indicator of either trouble or potential wins coming from a publicly traded company. Here's the, um, here's the thing though with these companies. If you look at operator sentiment, and I wanna kind of give a, a basis of understanding why both Beyond and Tyson and, and then over here uh, with Impossible, you have these potential growth tracks is because of operator sentiment. And the reason you need operator sentiment high is because a lot of these new products for many of these emerging uh, food brands have to be pulled through the restaurant system. You're talking about 800,000 restaurants, 700,000 right now, but a growth uh, measurement that's starting to track up again. Now with restaurants reopening, you've got to be able to pull product through. That's exactly how Beyond Meat did it. Their, their uh, flight path, so to speak, to success was by being able to place that product in the right kind of restaurants and or brands. That brand then was educating the consumer then that consumer would start to talk to theirs and now you've got return and refer and all these referral methods that we track constantly here on Foodable. And you get the advantage of really getting the product that is word of mouth. It's the water cooler effect and it's amplified through the professional zone of the restaurant. So when you look back at this data on Beyond, Beyond is actually tracking very low here and Tyson is tracking much higher because Tyson is a recognized brand with operators. Even though Tyson has kind of a uh, you know a little bit of a wavy uh, performance, the fact is is they are well recognized within. But Impossible is absolutely tracking high on operator sentiment. So what does that tell you? That tells you that there are operators out there that are willing to potentially choose Impossible over Beyond. And the only difference I think with Beyond and Impossible is that Impossible is really has not been in a position to really ramp up. And the reason is cash. You've got to have money to be able to grow that business at, at an exponential rate where uh, Beyond is over here taking in great investments and can get access to literally limitless capital at a very, very low, if anything, rate and be able to grow and expand their marketplace. So Ethan, 
Brown over at Beyond Meat is being, he's able, he's kind of got the leverage right now of being able to grow what Beyond Meat is doing. Doesn't necessarily say, as I said, I think we can have a couple of winners here in this space. I know that everybody's going to say, hey, there's going to be one big guy that's just absolutely going to, you know, tear the market apart. And you kind of see that even down in the regular animal protein business with Tyson. They, they pretty much kind of control the marketplace. But operator sentiment is an, an important one, is one that I am going to track very closely because if this continues to fly, Impossible has a chance to pull through the restaurant industry. And if they do that, they will get the same bounce that uh, Beyond Meat got into the consumer market and be able to really affect the retail investor and eventually the institutional investor, which is only going to take the stock to the moon. So let's look quickly over here at a chart I, I presented a couple of, uh, about a week or a month ago, I guess, uh, in really analyzing Tattoo Chef and also Beyond Meat. Uh, and if you look at kind of Beyond Meat and kind of where they're going, kind of look at this chart here, because it breaks out where Beyond Meat was going. And this was back from May of last year. You can kind of see uh, we were past the COVID but, uh, scenario. It, it started to really move up and you see a nice, you know, leveling off. Uh, same thing with Tattooed Chef, also kind of keeping pace there. But Tyson was the one here that I was referring to in that previous video because it was trending up for the first time and that tells me that restaurant operators are back in business and we're gonna to start to see that kind of demand. If, and back to the operator sentiment, impossible, we'll need a good, healthy restaurant business to be able to bring this through to the finish line and really get some things going. Because you know, obviously they've been out with Burger King, they've done a lot already in the, in the fast food space, but they need to win some of these casual dining and uh, fast casual concepts uh, and really be able to make some some marks. And when you look at some companies like Yum and McDonald's kind of partnering up with Beyond Meat, this is a little bit of a struggle if you're gonna try to use the QSR band, brands or the big fast casual concepts to grow your business. So you're, you're a bit behind the eight ball here because you are running from about a full lap back against Beyond Meat. But if Pat Brown holds true, the basis is he's going to go after the animal protein business and try to take from there, which is, I think, the actual lower hanging fruit than trying to convert existing brand lovers of someone like a Beyond Meat. When you look at the plant-based food dollar, and this is a chart that was done by Good Food, Good food Institute and Spins, this one right here breaks down kind of the breakout of the different categories that are starting to really bounce. Uh, Plant-based milk, that's the big one, but that's because you see so many players in there, mostly because of almond milk, oat milk, uh, a lot of the different uh, products that are out there in the milk category and re milk replacement, which is why I think we see a, a huge, in the dairy business, I should probably do a video on that, how the dairy business has been absolutely decimated by plant-based milk. This market is really exploding. Now, Impossible has indicated that they have a milk product or, or at least some uh, concepts on the board. Whether or not they can get out and uh, really affect that side of the business will be interesting. Other plant-based dairy, this is where you get into the cheese categories, uh, which I think are, are still flying very high, and there's a couple of big players in that market. Uh, then you get into plant-based meat, which is $1.4 billion. Um, hey, listen, $1.4 billion is not anything to scoff at, but remember, this is just on the plant-based sales side. So the upside, if you compare that to animal proteins, is absolutely a dwarf number in comparison to where we're going. Then you go into plant-based meals, protein and liquids, um, baked goods, condiments, and then all the way down into eggs uh, moving on there. So here's what I'm looking at. When you look at where vegan and plant-based products are going, and who are the players and the companies that are going to start to eat into that market share for those companies right there? Because this is going to be a slow growth on all across the board from a matter of uh, plant-based trends. And I'm going to be doing a video on this. You're going to have to go to foodabletv.com to see it. Um, it won't be here on YouTube, uh, but I'm going to be doing a, a, an actual plant-based trends uh, consumer uh, video on where the potential opportunities lie because there are some some big factors in where these companies could could slot in and how they're going to affect uh, either one in growth and also if they are an IPO or they're getting ready to go IPO. Uh, it'll start to kind of give that reveal. 
So just check out foodabletv.com for that. Well, it'll probably make the front page pretty soon. I want to go into the digital conversation index here because this is basically tracking the kind of uh, traffic that uh, is based on a combination of both traffic, weighted traffic and sentiment of people just mentioning plant-based products. So you have, you have three categories here. You have the vegans who obviously mention plant-based all the time. They're in the blue line. Uh, and they kind of have a, kind of a love and hate affair of different brands, but most of the time they're pretty strong in the marketplace around plant-based brands. Then you have plant-based uh, consumers who are not vegan but eat plant-based. That's me. I'll eat plant-based or try to eat plant-based a lot. Uh, I'm trying to reduce my proteins, animal proteins. That one is the orange line. That one is an area where consumers are in discovery mode. This is a great opportunity for Impossible Foods to really go in after that market share. That is a big, big market share, plant-based curious consumers. Those are the ones that I'm very interested in. Meat eaters is the interesting one to me because they get in, they get out, they get in. You can kind of see the love and then nah, I didn't like that so much in Q4, and then of course Q4 is kind of when everybody's, uh, you know, around the holidays, you've got all these meals, so things kind of change up a little bit. And then first of the year, Q1, everybody's on, hey, I gotta maybe lose a little weight, eat a, eat a little bit better, those kind of things. So these are a little bit uh, more indicative of these movements and ebb and flows of the consumer in what kind of foods they eat. That still, to me, is a great opportunity for Impossible and beyond and all the companies that are really going after this uh, plant-based craze, because I think you can start to convert those meat lovers. But the one that I think is the big one is the plant-based curious consumer. That, to me, is the bullseye for Impossible Foods. And measuring how they're affecting that marketplace is going to tell you how this stock performs, if they can get through the SPAC deal and make this thing happen. Let's talk about the emerging plant-based brands to kind of watch uh, because when I look at the brands and the categories and who's leading, who's winning, who's coming up the ranks, it tells me a lot of things. One, is there enough brand support there to drive a trend? There has to be. Um, here's, a, here's a good example of this. If you understand uh, the electric vehicle market, there's been one player in the game, and that's been Tesla. Um, until now, this is the first year where we've really seen new companies really start to make a, uh, an imprint on the EV market. And what's happening is we'll start to see movement in terms of sentiment around those companies as they start to drop product, right? And when you have that kind of scenario, you can start to look at adoption rates rising because you have a lot more marketing dollars pushing into the market, a lot more companies getting out there for exploration and discovery, and a lot more investors who are out there pushing the pins on how to be able to drive the companies who are at the top of the heap, which is what happens with the EV market. If you go over to emerging plant-based brands, look at this lineup. I mean, you've got a absolute stellar stock of companies that are already on the ground producing product in retail stores, in restaurant operations. Beyond Meat comes in at number one. Impossible, not even a public company, comes in at number two. Dr. Prager's, you know them from the grocery aisle. Alpha Foods, same thing. Hillary's, Amy's, Sophie's, Kite Hill, Gard Gardein, uh, Boca. All of these guys are well-known companies. Then you get into some of these a little bit unknown, and that is like the uh, Natamu, which is an ice cream company, Ocean Hugger, brand new uh, seafood replacement. Morningstar Farms, that's actually a, a well-known brand. I'm a little curious. I might want to dive into that data because I'm a little curious why that one's a little bit lower. No Evil Foods, very young. Uh, Van Leeuwen uh, Ice Cream, which is a very micro brand. Good Catch, just a startup, raised and rooted. That's another one that should be higher. That's an actual uh, Tyson Foods brand. But I don't know that they've actually made an imprint, an imprint on the market yet. Then you got Good Planet, which is somewhat younger, just as the company that used to be Hampton Creek. Uh, and now it's called Just, which we had uh, Josh Hetrick on our show not too long ago. Check out that video, because he kind of talks about where he's going with Just Egg. Uh, and that's that's mainly the big product there. Frankie and JoJo's Ice Cream, Daya, which should be scoring much higher, but they are in a very competitive uh, plant-based cheese market. Blue Nalu, 
absolutely almost unknown, but they are on some interesting things. Memphis Meats is a little different because it's lab grown. And I don't know that lab grown products have yet made the hurdle over consumers kind of pushing back on that. But as you can see, there is a ton of companies here that are either already in this market and it's a mature market and it's a food market, which is a huge opportunity for the industry. Let's get into issues to watch and price targets for Impossible. If they go public, if a SPAC can pull this off and bring them to the marketplace, the question will be, in my opinion, $4 billion valuation, which is what they uh, were valued at in the last year, and the $10 billion that is circling uh, with the sharks right now on whether or not it would go out a $10 billion valuation. Here's my assessment. Um, well, let me, let me, I'm going to wait before I give you my full assessment. I want to talk more about some of the things you need to watch because these are little triggers that will help you understand whether or not you should be investing in this company when it does go IPO. One, the team will need work along with the board. They've got to get a stronger team here. Not that these guys aren't strong, but they need some rock stars in this. I think they got to get into this milk business. It's going to help them it's, as you've seen it. The biggest challenge is going to be market education. And the only way through market education is to get into food service. They are on the right track there with where they're going. And if you look at uh, some other things, uh, there's another slide here. Number of locations where Impossible Food Burgers are sold has increased in the past year uh, to more than 20,000 from 150. The company basically revealed that. Shares of Rival Beyond Meat, obviously trading at 400% above its IPO price from 2019. And Impossible Foods Chief Financial Officer David Lee stepped down. We talked about that earlier. Um, this one kind of bothers me a little bit, uh, but he, enjoyed, he he basically joined an indoor farm builder, App Harvest. I don't get that. I just, <laughs> I don't get that because I feel like, he, you know, uh, Pat Brown's mission is big. It's, it's so big. And what he's trying to do, I just don't, uh, maybe... Maybe it's too big. I don't know. Maybe the team that you've got to step behind. I've heard from people that, you know, work under someone like Elon. You know, it is 24-7. You are going full on. And if you maybe you just you're not ready for that because this is where Impossible is at currently. This is the stage this company is in. But I want to jump back to their valuation and why this matters on my price target. Um, we get back to the 10 billion versus 4 billion uh, question mark. If the company comes out, I'm kind of wavering between a five and six billion dollar valuation. If they come out between a five and six or under, this is a huge buy. This will be a very profitable uh, company, I think, within the next few years. The cash injection is going to put Pat Brown on a track, I think, to really do some things. If he can nest a team under him to really get going hard and expose them into the marketplace and dominate. This could be a good run up over, much like uh, Beyond was, a run up over the next two years to get them. Whether, can they get 400% you know, growth? I don't know, but what I do see is the valuation is the pin, the linchpin to making this a successful IPO. If the valuation comes out over five and a half, six million dollars, I'm going to hold back a little bit before I would jump into this stock because I think it's gonna bounce and fall. Um, if they come out like that. Now, here's the caveat and here's the warning that I would give to all of you. As a reminder, I'm not an investment counselor. I do not give investment advice. We basically do this through analysis and understanding of the marketplace. And hopefully some of this research can help you make a better decision in your investments. But when you look at the potentials, if they come to market with a late drop on uh, basically news that they've done something, they've released some new breakthrough in their product before they go IPO, that would make me change my mind in terms of their valuation. But if they're going out with what is known right now today, what I know of Impossible Foods and what they've released, remember this is a privately held company, very private, very hard to get interviews from them and get them to talk. Uh, that will change now with an IPO because uh, once you're public, you've got to be able to start sharing this information. and. That'll be interesting to see how uh, Pat Brown does that because Ethan has done, Ethan Brown, uh, no relation, has done that very well. He is an, uh, a great, um, you know, front man for Beyond Meat. And I think it's been a, a big advantage 
being him as CEO to lead that company into a 400% growth. But I think Pat can do it. And I definitely, when you look at his vision and his mission and his, his conviction behind what he's doing, I think they're on the right track. But those are the things I would look for. Big releases, valuation over five and a half to six million, uh, slow down. If it's under six million, I definitely would jump into this stock and start uh, to really take a long-term look at it. I think this company has definitely got a good future regardless. The question is, is how fast can they get to uh, a really high-performing, high-flying stock? That's going to be the characterization that I'm going to be watching in terms of what they can do. We're going to be tracking them very uh, closely here on uh, the show and here on the network. Make sure and check back here, of course, for more great coverage like this. We do these market movers all the time where we really break down into the data and understanding of where the marketplace is going. If you have a show idea, just shoot us uh, an email to producer at foodabletv.com. That's for our food side of our uh, channel. If you're checking this out over on the podcast, make sure and leave a rating, all that good stuff. And if you are checking this out on YouTube, make sure and like this video, share it with somebody and subscribe so you can get more great content like this. And if you wanna hit me up, maybe you have a better idea of where Impossible is gonna come out or do you think this is a company that can go head to head with the animal protein companies like Tyson and others? And can they hold their own against Beyond Meat? Love to hear your, your feedback and your comments. Hit them down below and we'll catch you next time right here on the Baron Report.